We are honoured this evening to be joined by Derek Hunt. Uh, Derek's career as a professional stained glass artist spans almost 40 years, from studying under renowned glass artists Sax Shaw and D Douglas Hogg at Edinburgh Art College, to his contemporary practice as a traditional stained glass artist, continuously exploring innovative te techniques to push the artistic boundaries of the medium. Beyond his newly commissioned work and conservation projects, Derek serves as an educator in traditional glass painting, sharing his knowledge of painting through teaching masterclasses at his studio in Leicestershire and at the Ely Stained Glass Museum at Ely Cathedral. He also has established a prominent online presence, hosting online courses and a YouTube channel dedicated to stained glass, featuring tutorials, inspirational content and interviews with international glass artists. Welcome, Derek. How are you? I'm very well, Daniel. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of your podcast. You're very welcome. So we're going to jump straight into it. And I'm going to ask you the first question. And it's going right back to the beginning. Have you always had creative tendencies, even as a child? And if so, what form did they take? <laughs> creative tendencies. That's a great expression. Uh, yes, I've, I've always been creative. I, I think... Um, Thinking back to the early days, we used to live up in the highlands of Scotland. I'm the oldest of three brothers, and uh, my father was a, 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 a an amateur pilot, and he started a, a gliding club. So we were always interested in airplanes and flying, and so started with making airfix planes. And that sort of model making and working with your hands, I, I really enjoyed, and we all enjoyed making planes and displaying them. And that idea of kind of creating things with your hands and painting, I think I really enjoyed but I also I did a lot of drawing. I mean, I was I was able to do it. I just had a facility for it. And um, I suppose, like a lot of things, when you're young, if you can, if it comes to you naturally, you don't necessarily value it as highly as you might. Um, and so I just I I it took me a long time to really kind of realize actually this is something that I love doing more than anything else. And so my early years in 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 school at secondary school really were more and more geared towards art and I would um, I'd get prizes at school and I'd win competitions and and I I got to the point where I wasn't really sure on leaving school whether I wanted to be an architect or whether I wanted to be an artist because I had that sort of twin passions really um, but I decided to go down the art school route so applied to go to art school Edinburgh Art College that was my first choice and uh, arrived there uh, uh, as a young whippersnapper in 1980. Um, so I was going to study graphic design. That's what I first started with. I wanted to, I thought that's going to get me a job at the end of the day. I thought I may as well try and learn something that's going to sort of transition into kind of, co you know, commerce or whatever. And part of the first uh, year that you are at art school, certainly back in the day, um, was a foundation year. So you'd try a lot of different, uh, uh, different subjects, which was fantastic. Uh, so I did I did some sculpture, obviously drawing and painting, lots of life drawing, um, uh, a little bit of fashion design, a little bit of graphic design. And then I walked into the stained glass department to try my hand at stained glass and absolutely loved it. I was just immediately, there was this kind of realization that um, it, at the time, the stained glass studio, which isn't in existence anymore, had very tall windows it was up on the on the second floor overlooking the main campus area at the art school and this color and light and dynamism just immediately appealed to me and also the idea of working with your hands I kind of felt there was a, a an honesty um, uh, about working with your hands so although I had decided initially that I wanted to go down the graphic design route I changed to stained glass and so fortunately uh, I was able to study stained glass as a specialist subject for for the next three years at art school with as you mentioned Sack Shaw uh, and Douglas Hogg uh, both uh, amazing glass artists in their own right and it was a fantastic experience I, I so enjoyed being at art school and and learning from uh, from the masters really uh, and it was a deep dive into the whole process of stained glass making which sadly uh, nowadays isn't really available to the same extent uh, but we can get into that uh, but yeah th though my early days to answer your question yes uh, model making lots of drawing and I, I discovered a facility for for drawing which uh, just 
but which I, I you know I didn't necessarily appreciate mm-hmm. in my early years but then obviously now appreciate and, and love and can't think of doing anything else really interesting to hear you talk about the embodied element of the craft as, as well as the art and the balance between the two uh, we find that a lot obviously amongst amongst our members it's it's not just the abs- art in the abstract it's it's the actual doing it and the combination of the two that make it really special i agree i think there's something um i, I remember when when i was a child one of our family friends was a carpenter and i, I remember always being amazed by his kind of woodworking skills in his home he had sort of fishing rods and fly fishing he would make his own fly fishing looms and that whole facility of being able to work with your hands and creating things I think was embedded in me sort of subliminally just from being in a community of people and yeah so so it it resonated with me the whole idea of making definitely resonated with me so when you were studying stained glass at college, was the expectation that you would go on to set up as a, a sole, sole trader, as an artisan, or that you would work within a stained glass workshop? What what was the, the vision? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think when I was when I was learning, I really just wanted to try and get good at it. I wasn't very good at it at all to start with. I, you know, I, I didn't really have... Um, a lot of kind of craft skills going into the course. I I really was drawing and painting and I was good at drawing. I was good at life drawing and those kind of things. So learning craft skills was new to me. And uh, yeah, it was, it didn't, didn't come easily. So I think I spent most of the time at art school really just trying to, to learn to get, to get good at painting and making stained glass windows. And I think it was a very deep dive into the whole process of being creative. And so we would have visiting lecturers and we'd have visiting outside assessors coming in. And it was a wonderful, wonderfully conducive um, environment. But I don't know that I thought too much about what I was going to do after art school until I until I graduated. And then I realized I wanted to continue in stained glass. I knew that I wanted to continue. So I like so many uh, crafts, it's very difficult to find an inroad. And I found in Scotland at that time, this was 1984, uh, there were really no openings in stained glass studios at that time. So I began looking south of the border and I discovered that a studio in Leicester, and I'd never been to the city of Leicester, where we're looking for a glass painter. Uh, at that time, this particular company would, was doing a lot of large projects in the Middle East uh, and uh, they were looking for painters and they were doing conservation restoration work. So I got on the train, moved down to Leicester and uh, started working for this particular company. And I hated it. <laughs> I absolutely hated it because basically it was a factory environment. You were clocking on and you were clocking off. And I, to be honest, Daniel, I was an appalling uh, employee. I would get in late in the morning. I'd want to work late at night. I still had the, the the attitude of being a student, you know, this kind of the idea that I worked when almost when the muse uh, uh, landed. And so that I was no good as an employee. And I, I didn't like being there. So I decided after nine months, I would set up on my own. So at the tender age of 23, I think it was, I set up my own studio I, I i left this particular company and i'd only been in the city of leicester for about nine months i didn't know anybody i had no connection so it really really was ground zero starting from st- scratch so uh, the girlfriend i had at the time very very kindly allowed me to use the garage side of the house and i basically started from there and i printed some leaflets out and i put the leaflets out through the door and started just trying to hustle for work <laughs> Uh, so, you know, it was a slow start, as you can imagine, not knowing anybody, not having any connections. Um, it took a while before I got my first project uh, of significance, uh, starting off doing door panels and repairs and things. As a lot of people in the glass world will understand, that can be your bread and butter to start with preparing domestic panels. Uh, but I got a project at a church, a, a very uh, benevolent architect decided to give me to tr- decide to trust me basically with a stained glass commission to conserve and restore a series of clerestory windows in a church and his 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 parting gesture before this chat project started was make sure you're you've got insurance Derek because obviously he just wanted to make sure that if all went pear-shaped 
at least there was an insurance covering it. So that was my kind of baptism of fire doing that particular project. And it continued from there. So I, I stayed in Leicester for about 15 years developing my studio. Um, and I was employing maybe two or three people at a time doing projects. And it, it was a busy time. You know, I did a lot of different projects. I did a lot of um, commercial projects for restaurants and bars. At that time, that was a lot of the type of work that uh, a lot of studios were doing. I wasn't really enjoying it, though. You know, it was it was commercial work. Mm -hmm. And every now and then I was getting new commissions and I got a new commission to design an east window for St. Crispin's Church quite early on. Uh, and I used the deposit for that project to buy my kiln. I didn't even have a kiln before I got the project. So that was a, I don't know, a, a 15, 20 square meter new east window which is a brilliant project to get. Uh, and that really gave me the appetite for continuing to kind of develop my artistic um, uh, avenues in stained glass rather than going down the commercial route and rather than going down, strictly speaking, the conservation route. I knew I wanted to be a creative. I, I wanted to create stained glass. So eventually I got to the point where um, I actually stopped enjoying running a studio and employing people. I didn't like being a boss. I didn't like being that guy that said, what time do you call this? Or, this project should be finished by now. And, you know, I, I just didn't like being that person. And I also didn't like having to bring in projects because I had staff to, to, to uh, pay. Uh, I did that for 15 years uh, and I realized that it was making me unhappy. It's not really where I wanted to be. So I made the decision to really move out of Leicester uh, and find a place where I could run, start my own studio, where I could live and work and really just take on projects that I wanted to take on, projects that inspired me, that interested me, that got my, my heart racing, you know. So uh, we looked for old churches or, you know, churches to kind of live in and, and convert to a, a working studio. Uh, we looked at old uh, uh, schools, you know, trying to buy somewhere that you could actually uh, work and live in. And this place where I'm speaking from today arrived. It's um, it's a Victorian reading room and it's like a barn. It's a two story barn and it's next to our house, which is an old pub. It used to be a pub. It was built in 1650. So it's an Elizabethan pub. And it was one of four pubs in the village. And we live in a tiny village uh, and it had four pubs. Amazing. Uh, so um, we we bought uh, the, the studio in 1999 and I moved, made the big choice to move out of the city of Leicester that I'd been for 15 years, proceeding, renting, et cetera. And I started really, almost started again, just working on my own and deciding to take on projects that really interested me. And it was the best decision I ever made because I regained my happiness. I regained my joy. And that, I think that's really important if you're if you're a creative, that you have joy, you know. So, um, yeah, that was a big thing. So, so I've been here since 1999 in my studio uh, and I work on my own. Uh, I also work with other studios for larger projects. Um, but it, it's been a tremendous kind of journey to get to this point. And so it's, I'm still feel like I'm in the honeymoon pe period. You know, I've been doing this for nearly 40 years and I, it's, it still feels fresh and new. So um, I'm, I'm very lucky. I'm very lucky in that I was able to continue from art school and make it a professional career. And a lot of it's down to luck, but um, also that, that, that determination I think that you need. And I'm sure lots of people who are involved in crafts and trying to make a living from their crafts know that perseverance and determination is probably the thing that will get you across the line in terms of success, however you define that success to be. Um, I mean, you can teach practical skills, and I do a lot of teaching in what I do, and you can teach processes and techniques. What you can't teach um, is enthusiasm, determination, curiosity. Those are the things that you have to find in yourself. And I think th those, those are the things that 
that really um, help you develop your craft into something that is personal, a personal expression of yourself. So uh, yeah, art, uh, to answer your question, art school was the route that I got into stained glass. We, we've heard that a similar trajectory from other craftspeople kind of going through some possibly unenjoyable uh, years um, and then but then rediscovering the joy and then finding a niche, getting your name out there and getting known for what you do. And I think that 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 enjoyment uh, comes across in the work that you're producing and uh, kind of all works out for the best in the end. Well, I, I think being being an artist or being a craftsperson is a vocation. It's a vocation. It's a it's it's something that you feel you 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 can't see yourself doing anything else. You don't want to do anything else. Uh, and so that there has to be joy, essentially, in that you know because that's going to see you through the difficult times, mm -hmm. and there are lots of difficult times. Um, and I think that that you have to kind of constantly re refer back to those core principles you know that, that it's what you love it's what you, you it's it's how you identify yourself i think all of us to a greater or lesser extent identify us with what we do i mean obviously there are many ways of identifying yourself you can identify yourself as a mother as a father whatever you know but also what you do for five days six days out of every week mm -hmm. is a big way of identifying yourself so you know you you having joy in what you're doing is is a very big part of it i think and also not downplaying the the wealth of experience you get from through going through those difficult years and um, and the benefit that brings you in the long run absolutely absolutely uh so we're going to bring it up to date now but just before we do remind people to please ask your questions in the chat and we will we'll pull some out in a short while uh, so I was going to ask you if you could walk us through the process of creating a stained glass piece through commissioning to design and then finally completion. What does it look like on average? Um, so the great thing about making stained glass windows is every project is different. So, you know, I, I wear different hats in what I do. So I, I wear the creative heart hat as, a, as an artist. I also am an accredited conservator, so um, I, I do conservation projects. I've got some 15th century glass in just now that I'm working on uh, with the Church's Conservation Trust, and I often go out and write reports uh, and condition reports for stained glass windows in order for uh, churches, etc., to apply for grants. So being an accredited conservator is is part of what I do. I also have the hat of being, being a teacher. So... Um, as far as answering the question about how, how stained glass projects are started, very often you'll get an inquiry through uh, either an email, uh, most often an email from either an architect or a steering committee who might be considering a new commission. I do a lot of new commissions still for, for the church. And so there will be a principal person that will uh, start a conversation with me and uh, they may come to the studio. I had some people recently coming to the studio to talk about a new project um, I will then often go go and visit them. So I like to go to the site. It's really important to actually see the, the possible placement of the stained glass because really the stained glass, especially in a church or in any building for that matter, has to fit into the building. It has to work uh, in harmony with the rest of the building rather than being crowbarred in. So going down and visiting the site, meeting uh, usually a steering committee, uh, that's the initial steps. Um, I'm going through an interesting project just now where I'm documenting the whole process. It's for nine windows for a church down in uh, East Horsley, down uh, near Guildford. And it started several years ago with discussions about a bank of, of sort of nine windows on this uh, north elevation of a church. And we talked about it for a long time and I would visit the church. And eventually we began community engagement. So community engagement is this buzzword that is often uh, thrown around, but it's actually really key. It's really important. And community community engagement plays a big part in how I, um, how I gain the information that I need in order to start the process of designing for a new project. So I'll go down to site and I'll meet with the steering committee and we'll discuss the project uh, and we'll get ideas. And I talk about a melting pot 
everything goes into the melting pot. So anything and everything that the, the steering committee thinks might be relevant or might be important for a commission goes into the melting pot. And generally speaking, we talk about an overarching theme for a commission. So if it's a church project, there'll be some overarching spiritual uh, theme uh, on which you then hang other elements in little vignettes and little subtexts and other stories. And I love layering uh, the designs with different meanings. So, so the early stages are really consultation, community engagement, engaging uh, as much information as you can that goes into the melting pot. And with some projects, if it's a secular project, it will be involving perhaps local school children or local um, historical societies or local poets. There's, there's lots of different ways of obtaining information, but it's all about bringing the community on board so that they take ownership of the project. So that you, I'm not just parachuting some design into a into a community. You know, we've all seen the terrible public art that sits, you know, in in a square, and you know, that just has no bearing on the rest of the, the environment because it's it's an artwork. You know, I think it's so important that you talk to the community, that you engage with the community, and they take ownership of it. And it becomes an adventure. You know that that's. It's really exciting when you get a project where you you are walking. It's an act of faith between you and the community walking towards an idea and, and realizing that slowly through dialogue and discussion and, and etching, sketching and, and you know, iteration. Uh, and it's a beautiful thing when it works it, and it's it's an enjoyable thing. So so I've taken to documenting that be, and, and eventually I'll put uh, some a YouTube project together from initial dialogue through through all and we do zoom meetings like this where we we've recorded the zoom meetings where the community will talk about various aspects and it can be quite emotional people are sometimes in tears you know talking about what they want for for uh for the window it's it, it's really enjoyable uh so so yeah so i will document that and you'll get hopefully you'll get that at at some point when the project, we're close to completing the project. It's being made now and we're due to install it um, really in a few weeks time. So it's coming to fruition and it's a very exciting project. So um, in fact, I can show you a little bit about it if you want to, if you want to yeah, see that. Um, I wonder if we can. Um, while you're doing that uh, yeah just to, it's really interesting to hear how it's a, a dialogue conversation between yourself and the client and the community and the artwork kind of comes from the synthesis synthesis of those yeah but, exactly um let me just share i wonder if i can share that screen can you see this yes so um this is this is the project that i'm talking about it's nine windows for east horsley church and this was the design, it was a contemporary abstract design. So we went through a lot of iterations of, of traditional designs. Uh, and then we eventually got this kind of sort of beautiful abstract design, no no lead in it. It's all laminated glass. Uh, so this is the artist's impression of it here. Is that coming up okay on your yes. screen? Yeah, it looks fantastic. So the, the, it's based on basically the pandemic and they wanted to kind of mark the, the, the fact that it was a big, for well, that local community, at East Horsley, it was a very big thing to go through the pandemic. And so we wanted to create a window that talk, talked about regeneration and growth and recovery. So we used nature uh, uh, and plant forms as, an, as a sort of visual metaphor for regrowth and rebirth. And the oak leaf is a very big part of that uh, local community. So I created these designs and we did, made sample panels that are actually being made for me now. Let's move further down. I went over to Germany. So I used the bigger studios for bigger projects like this. And this is a technically quite a difficult window to make because it's laminated glass. It's not something I do in my own studio. So I went over earlier in the year and chose all the glass with this particular studio, uh, Peter's studio in Paderborn, one of the fantastic German studios. Um, and I lament the fact that we don't have... Uh, the big studios left in the UK that can still do it. Um, so we kind of went through the whole process of creating the designs. Let me just move down to some of the making. So this is some of the making work that's being undertaken just now. Uh, let's move quickly down. Sorry to skim through a lot of the things, but you can see the 
the windows are being made on the light table. So they, 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 they continually send me work in progress. Let's move down to the last set of windows. So it's, it's very exciting. I haven't seen these in the flesh yet, but they're going to be delivered to me sometime soon. So they're working on my behalf. And it's wonderful working with the larger studios because you, you can go over there and you can basically oversee the painting or you can do the painting work yourself. Um, so this project is coming to fruition. And this was a big community engagement played a very big part in this whole project. So I'll, I'll stop the screen sharing in a minute, but you get the idea. Mm. Uh, it's a lovely project to work on. And so they're they're getting to the point where it's almost completing completing it. So there's a lot of etching and uh, various elements involved. Let's stop the share now. Uh, so so yeah, so that 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 community engagement, so that process from start to finish is is on is an ongoing process and involving the community is so so much a part of that. Mm. Um, um, and as I say, I love making, I mean, I'm a craftsman. I, I, I love to make my own stained glass. I have a studio set up for it and I make glass in the traditional way that it's been made for centuries. And I do all the processes from taking the windows out, putting them back in, designing them, making them, painting them, the whole, the whole thing. I, it's a proper sort of arts and crafts mm -hmm. in the traditional sense, that kind of integrity of, of, um, husbanding a, a process through from start to finish. But I do use the larger studios, both in the UK and in Europe for, for bigger projects, because often there's a time constraint. You know, you have to do it within a timely manner. So if I were to do a big project on my own, it could last for years. And clients don't want to wait for years for things. So I work with the bigger studios as well. That's a fantastic insight into the process. And you can see see in that project how you had to work within a brief and what you've produced is absolutely beautiful. Uh, but presumably they've chosen you because they they love your past work, they love your aesthetic. So so if you had to kind of distill your your own uh, take on stained glass, your inspirations, what well, where do you where do you go for your inspiration? Is it history, mythology, nature? What would how would you define that? Uh, yeah, every project is different. Uh, every project is different, Daniel. So the inspiration is source. The source material comes from different projects, uh, di different sources each time. Uh, if I'm doing something creative and new, and it's a new design, I I go to nature. I live in the countryside, and 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 nature and the landscape and the rural landscape is a big influence for me. So plant forms play a large part of what I do. Um, and uh, and uh, the tree of life quite often features or versions of the tree of life because it's a very accessible uh, symbol. I think it ap appeals not only to um, the spiritual dimension, but also to um, those, you know, who aren't actually uh, spiritual. Uh, so the tree of life is something that I use often, but that, but if I'm, you know, it depends on what the brief is. So some sometimes I will look for historical references. Uh, it, it 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 every project is different. So so yeah, the 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 inspiration comes from a variety of different fields. Fantastic. We're going to break for some audience questions now, and I see we've had a couple coming into the chat. But just before we go to them, uh, we've had a question submitted in advance by Jane Bradford. Uh, Jane, I wondered if you wanted to unmute and ask Derek your question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, um, Derek. I was just mm. wondering if you would know. Um, I'm I'm a beginner in stained glass painting and making, and I'd like to really be able to access some authentic sort of old stained glass, medieval or saints and angels type things like patterns or cartoons. Yeah. Um, I've been looking for quite a while and I, I honestly haven't found any resources. Um, I, I've looked into a few museums and whatnot, but I just I just wondered if you would know any resources or where to look for those, if they're available at all. Well, they are available from institutions as well as from individuals. Um, what immediately springs to mind is things like the Ely Stained Glass Museum 
it has a repository of of stained glass and you can search that online so you can get access to images um that are part of the collection at ely stained glass museum um, um i'm chair of uh, the the, the stained glass repository for the worshipful company of glaziers and we have a a website there which shows um stained glass that's part of the repository and it's it's the repository rescues stained glass from redundant churches or churches that are being sold stores it with a view to then gifting it or reciting it in churches so it's a great cause it's a great thing to be involved with and it also has a website that you can search but on social media, Flickr, for example, I know a lot of glass artists, um, and I can I can post details somewhere, I'm sure, at the end of this podcast, to Flickr sites where there's a great collection of photographs being being constantly added to by glass enthusiasts and, and, and historians who take an interest in stained glass. So there are places that you can source images. Mm -hmm. um uh, it just takes a little bit of delving to find them but they're they are available oh that's wonderful thank you so much derek you're welcome yeah thank you thanks for your question jane i'm now going to pass over to my colleague biz who's been uh, following the chat uh, and yeah are there any questions to pull out biz yeah we have a few of them jane had put hers in there so we can i'll go the one above um we have a question from ellie grana Hi, I'm really interested to hear your journey. Thank you. I'm setting up my own studio this year after five years away from glass. Graduated from York Stained Glass Conservation degree in 2019. What are your biggest tips for getting set up? Yeah, that kind of beginner full launch. I know you were talking about starting from scratch again in 1999, but um, I think that'd be a good kind of starting point with the questions. Great question. Great question, Ellie. Thank you. Uh, yeah. It's a challenge. It really is a challenge. I think what I, if I were to give you any advice, it is to try and network as much as possible. Put, try and find as many other uh, like-minded souls, visit studios, talk to other glass artists, talk to craftsmen. There are various bursaries and travel scholarships available which help you uh, in terms of getting experience. Um, so, you know, if you're graduating, that network, try and get placements if you can in studios you will learn so much by being in a proper uh, stained glass environment working with other craftspeople you'll learn faster and you, you'll learn more than than trying to study and invent the wheel all on your own um, I had that lonely experience of working on my own and it is difficult because you you often don't know who to ask you don't know if you're solving a problem in the right way or if you're solving it completely the wrong way so networking and trying to establish a network of uh, like-minded craftspeople is, is possibly the best advice I can offer you um, and Picking up the phone and just talking to other craftspeople, you'll be surprised how helpful people can be. I stand on the shoulders of uh, glass artists who have helped me along the way. Um, people like Keith Barley, who runs Barley Studios uh, up in York, ha has always been fantastic, really helpful. I, I used to visit him from time to time, and he would give me little sample pots of paint to work with um, that I couldn't afford to buy myself. Or I'd go down to Canterbury Studios, and uh, Dr. Sebastian, or Professor Sebastian Strobel, as he is now, would help me. Uh, and people are willing to help. So if you if you have that passion and have that excitement and interest, other people recognize it and it, you'll be surprised by how helpful people can be. That's probably the best single thing I could suggest you do. Try and get bursaries, try and get scholarships. It is very difficult. It's very difficult. We're in this very strange environment just now where um, it's very difficult. It's very scrappy trying to find your way in the world. But the Worshipful Company of Glaziers that I mentioned earlier is one of the guilds of London, and it is one of the best organizations that helps young artists develop. So it provides the Stevens Competition, which um, is a prize, uh, an annual prize, which is a real commission that you can enter enter, and you, you get adjudicated and judged. And I've been a judge uh, for the Stevens Competition in the past. It also gives bursaries and traveling scholarships. 
So the Worshipful Company of Glaziers is, is a very good one to talk to. The British Society of Master Glass Painters also uh, gives financial help. But it's very scrappy and it's very bitty and you have to be determined and you're kind of stringing a variety of different sources of income together to try and travel to different studios. But I think networking would be the one thing that I would say will help you. Other than that, just determination. Everybody who's successful at this, the one similarity between all of them is they've not given up and they've, they've stuck through the difficult times. And there are lots of difficult times uh, especially nowadays where we're, you know, we're, we're in a, a difficult economic environment. Be determined, network, pick up the phone. Don't be afraid to ask for help. You'd be surprised how helpful people can be. Wonderful. Um, I think you've touched upon too some of the other questions around you know, being a young person wanting to engage in this craft, where to start, the barriers. I think you've covered a bunch um, there, but I know... Uh, Helen Robinson had asked a question earlier, but then did a follow-up comment. Helen, did you want to share it yourself and talk about the resources that have been helpful for you so far? If not, I can just read your comment either or. Uh, sorry, please ask that question again. I didn't quite understand it. Uh, we had a, a similar question that you already um, answered about, you know, what are the barriers for young makers now or you know, wanting to get into stained glass. Um, uh, someone commented um, saying that the being a member of the British Society of Master Glass Painters um, and attending conferences has been really helpful and the study days and lectures plus their journal of stained glass. Um, so that's another thing to share. It's in the comments if anyone would like to look at it. I think um, Helen's unmuted now if she wants to add anything. Oh, yeah. To Hi. Hi. Hello. <clears throat> yes, I've never managed to unmute before. I've just managed it. Um, yes, I mean, that, that it, for me, the BSMGP, British Society of Masterclass Painters, has been an absolutely fundamental for the last 25, 30 years in getting out there and looking at glass. I think there's nothing that can really replace that. Um, going into poking around in old churches, looking at the most amazing glass, and even though your work now may not be church work, just to see how the medium works in its historic setting, it has been um, irreplaceable really as an experience for me. Um, but yeah, my other question, I think, which um, the lady earlier mentioned, I, I had asked a question asking Derek what he thought perhaps if he could try to distill the main barriers perhaps and also opportunities for youngsters coming into glass now wanting to set up their careers their studios um the church isn't is no longer really our uh, perhaps as, as as much a client as it once was particularly when you're starting up so where do you think those opportunities may be derek um be interested to hear what you think Great question, Helen. Uh, I First of all, I agree with you entirely with the British Society of Master Glass Painters. It is a fabulous society. And I, I like you, I've been a member uh, uh, for, for, for many, many years, and they do fabulous work. So if you're interested in stained glass, two organizations, the British Society of Master Glass Painters and the Worshipful uh, Company of Glaziers in London are two organizations that you should make yourself familiar with. Um, yeah, great question. How do people start? I mean, I, I, I recently was involved with helping two glass artists at the start of their career begin their businesses for, for a BBC program called Making It Market. And it was really great to go through that process with them. And I think nowadays, the way the world is now, whether you like it or whether you loathe it, social media is, is a really helpful leg up for starting. We've lost one of the fundamental cores, I think, that has helped, I'm sure, both you and I and many, uh, many glass artists who may be running studios just now, which is the art school route. The art school route was instrumental in creating generations of creative artists who then went on to establish studios. That, to a very large extent, has been abandoned, although there are colleges like Swansea and Sunderland who still offer modules in stained glass and I want to congratulate them for doing that in very difficult and challenging times but broadly speaking the the deep dive of stained glass that isn't really there anymore so 
if you're starting out, <clears throat> make yourself familiar with as many other stained glass artists as possible and get involved with social media and put your work out there on social media. That has the largest potential, I think, for reaching the biggest audience <clears throat> and that you can monetize it. So if you want to make a living making stained glass, um, you know, start that Instagram account, start that Facebook page, um, you know, I, I, and put yourself out there because now we're living in the 21st century. <clears throat> That's where your audience is. Where do we normally go? Where do all of us go now? If we've got a question, we go to our phone and we go onto Google. So we're all there in that <clears throat> virtual space now. And I think you need to be there and you need to be available to, to for people if they're searching for glass, if they're searching for a project, large project, small project, having, having, um, yourself easily found on social media and having content on social media is possibly one of the best things if you're starting out that you can do mm -hmm. uh, going down the craft route uh, going down uh, craft galleries and things like that is possible a way forward as well but um you know galleries will take a commission so you know a hefty chunk of the the value in a project will go to a gallery i'm not saying don't do it but um try and be as independent as you can and independently financed as you can and um, paddle your own canoe as much as you can uh, rather than relying on galleries or other organizations to do it for you. I think being self-motivated. Am, yeah. Am I yeah, still on are. air? Am I still on air? Yes. Um, the other thing which I found fundamental was the local county open studio events. Yes. I found that uh, it's relatively inexpensive to take part and you get people beating a path to your door, which is great. The majority, of course, are just, oh, I love stained glass. I've always loved it. You said, well, would you like to commission some then? And of course, then you, you do pick up jobs and they start small. But that was really, I, I in years gone by, I picked up more work than I could ever do from doing that on small, at the smaller level. And then that gets your work seen. It helps you to build a portfolio. And then you're off with a bit of luck and a following wind. Fantastic suggestion. I completely agree with you. It goes down to the whole networking thing, doesn't it? Networking yeah. covers a variety of different bases, not only going to visit studios, but also putting yourself out within the community, open studios, those kind of things. It's really making that effort to not ex not necessarily just expect commissions to, to arrive as an email, but really put yourself out there. Um, mm -hmm. That's, that's uh, yeah. And uh, open studios is a great, is a great suggestion. Thanks so much for your question, Helen, and thank you everyone for your questions. Um, I should say as well, if we don't get time to ask all the questions, we can at least forward them from the chat to Derek afterwards, so at least he's had sight of them, and maybe he'll get in touch with you afterwards. I'll do my best to answer everyone. So I was going to um, touch upon the fact that you recently attended the Heritage Crafts and British Society of Master Glass Painters Symposium on stained glass skills following the addition of stained glass window making to the red list of endangered crafts. What were your main takeaways from the day and did, did you leave feeling more or less optimistic about the future of the craft and why? Uh, great question. Yes, that was a fantastic day and we met in person there and uh, it, was a it was a fantastically organized day and it was great to see so many people there. It was by invitation. So I don't think anybody's really knew until we arrived at the Art Workers Guild in London, who else would be there. And it was just wonderful to see so many people within our, our small tribe of stained glass there. So it was a great event. And so I was energized by it. Um, did I did I change my views on stained glass? Not really. I mean, I, I think I, I, I have... I have a kind of an overview of, of quite a few years of, of, of being a practicing glass artist. And I think anybody who's involved in stained glass in a professional level or even studying it will know that that um, we're in difficult times. The um, Your wonderful organization has recently put stained glass on the endangered list, which I think has been helpful because it allows us to now talk about it openly with a variety of other people. So uh, my takeaway was that communication is great. Communication is key. And the fact that we were communicating not only within uh, stained glass as a, as a body, but with uh, uh, heritage crafts and with architects and with other groups outside the society, I think it, that that 
communication and that dialogue is key. Um, for me, one of the key aspects that's missing uh, is not the apprenticeship scheme. The apprenticeship scheme that's been started with Swansea is fantastic. And it's laudable that they are starting to run an apprenticeship scheme uh, for the next generation. But I think hand in hand with learning practical skills, the practical application of the of the process is also nurturing that next generation of creatives. And we have to find a way to do what the art colleges aren't really doing just now, with the great exception of Swansea Art College and, and Sunderland. Um, most of the art colleges have abandoned uh, applied arts. It's not just stained glass, you know, tapestry, um, mosaics, even glass blowing. A lot of those hand skills have been abandoned in favor of the digital world and the digital market. Um, and you can't blame, to a large extent, you can't blame art schools for that because the marketplace has changed. But we have to find a way of doing what the art colleges did, and that is doing a deep dive somehow in 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 infusing that next generation of creatives with the imagination that you need to create good art to create good glass so i think what i my big takeaway from that particular gathering was let's find a way to try and create uh, there's an organization in america called pilchuck which which invites artists to do hot housing courses and uh, students come in from all over the world and learn. We need an equivalent of Pilchuck here in the UK where we can have master classes, master classes uh, and we can have invited artists and invited tutors to come in and really do deep dives on the creative aspect of the craft. That to me was my big takeaway. And obviously I do a lot of work with um, Ely Stained Glass Museum, which is a fabulous museum. If you if you are interested in stained glass and you haven't been, Ely Cathedral, beautiful, fantastic, uh, 400 years of stained glass on show. Uh, wonderful. Uh, and they, they are probably one of the best place organizations to help make that happen. And I know there's a lot of work happening behind the scenes to try and bring about some kind of center for excellence, whether it's at Sunderland, um, the Glass Museum at Sunderland, whether it's at Swansea, whether it's at Ely, somewhere we have to try and generate that centre of excellence to do what the art colleges used to do. Uh, so that was my big takeaway from that meeting. I'd be very interested uh, in getting your take on it, Daniel, because you have a long history in the craft and you have an overview of a lot of the crafts. Um, you know, what what was your takeaway from that meeting? How what What did you feel... Uh, were part of possible ways forward from mm -hmm. that. So it was very, very interesting. There were a lot of issues that were specific to stained glass, but there were also a lot of issues that we hear again and again across other crafts. So the the point that came across very strongly, uh, which I think is probably stronger in in this discipline than others, is this importance of the artistic inspiration and nurturing that alongside the, the technical skills. It, it's not just a, a technical occupation, it's 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 an artistic one. And I think we need to uh, keep that at the forefront of our minds at all times. Some of the more generic issues, and I think there are two key ones that have made things really difficult in terms of transmission of skills to the next generation. And it's not rocket science, it's the reduction of creative subjects at schools, which has um, meant kids are coming out of school with no idea of these careers being possible and very underdeveloped uh, creative expression uh, on the one side. And then on the other, it's the lack of funding for, for training. Um, uh, the majority of the heritage craft sector are either sole traders or micro businesses of 10 or fewer operating marginally profitable businesses. And these businesses are viable, but they need to be worked on at all times. The people are at the at the cold face of production. They can't afford to step away from any period of time in order to spend time with a, a trainee. It's a it's a huge distraction from from the from your output and not, and then your your income. Uh, in many cases, uh, an apprentice isn't an asset to a small business until year three or four. 
Uh, they're a big liability and people don't seem to realize that, particularly policymakers and, and funders. Uh, so our, our big drive at the moment is try and access the apprenticeship levy in more uh, uh, in different ways, not just through the government backed apprenticeships, which are fantastic, but there's too few of them. And in many cases, they're not being delivered because uh, the uh, at the off the job training element is not being delivered by uh, local FE colleges or specialist providers. I know in, in the case of stained glass, that is happening, thankfully, with Swansea University. Uh, but a lot of small businesses, when they first approach this idea of uh, apprenticeships, they don't realise that the only cost that's being covered is the off-the-job training. It's not helping with the apprenticeship wage. It's not providing any compensation for their loss of earnings from their reduced production. So it's just very difficult and we we know this money is in the system we heard the year before last and this it's there should have been a moral outrage about this across the whole country that 2.2 billion pounds of unspent apprenticeship levy was returned to the treasury and that money had been allocated for training and it just couldn't be used because of the nature of the infrastructure uh, so that's a big focus for us at the moment. See if we can access that money in, in, in different ways for different types of training and just make it more available. Um, I, I, I completely agree. I completely agree. Um, the, the, the fact that I, I had a free education uh, and the fact that that free education is, is, is really not available now and our, it, education has been monetized. Education is now a money making business and, and 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 colleges are now looking to you know to to make money out of education. It, it it to me that's a disaster. I mean, we shouldn't be monetizing education. It should be free at the at the point of of, of delivery. Uh, and the fact that we are not investing in the next generation, our next generation of young people is is a is a, is a crime, you know? It it is it is unconscionable to me that we don't invest in that next generation who will then retain the skills and, and carry on setting up future businesses. Uh, it seems so myopic, so, so short-sighted. Um, and um, I don't see the government changing that anytime soon. So we have to be more creative and, uh, and, and, you know, we, it's, it's a real piecemeal job and for, for the young generation now to try and piece enough resources together, enough finances and bursaries and travel scholarships to make it work. Um, and so the big gap for me is um, the art colleges really having abandoned it and, and education really not being free at the, at the point of delivery. Um, those, are, those, those are fundamental to everything else falling away. So the supplier, the supply chain, you know the the makers of sheet glass, the makers of paints, etc., are working with an ever de decreasing market, and so you know there's a knock on effect for the delivery of materials, etc. So, you know, trying to reverse that trend, I think, starts with with the creative investment uh, for that next generation and providing facilities and nu a nurturing environment, whatever that might look like, for that next generation to learn. And to gain the confidence that you need to, you know, set out on your own as a, as a, as a practicing creative. Yeah, I think you touched on it a couple of times. The successes that we do see seem to be despite the system rather than because of it. Um, but hopefully we can continue to share those successes and share good practice and and, and get get more people doing it. But yeah, it, it it's uh, an uphill slog at times. Um, I didn't mean to talk for so much and uh, got me into a bit of a rant. So we'll we'll bring it back on track. No, I, I, you, you've <laughs> saved me ranting because I'd be ranting as well. I just, it, it's it's you know it, it the fact that we we are so creative here in this small island of Britain. We are we have tremendous creative industries: our film industry, our music industry, our fashion industry, and the fact that our governments don't invest in it. They're quite happy to take the taxes from it, but they don't invest in it. They don't see any value in it, and I think. Part of the thing that we can do collectively across the craft sector is discover a way to kind of reframe the value of the handmade, how important it is, how valuable it is. Um, 
I mean, we're living in through this amazing revolution now of artificial intelligence. It's going to change absolutely everything. Artificial intelligence is already writing music and creating visuals. And, you know, and so you get to the point where you wonder what the value of human interaction is. And I think the fact that we can make things and it's handmade, that has an intrinsic value completely separate from anything that's digitally created, whether it's a piece of ceramic pottery uh, or a painting, the fact that there's the marks of the creator on it has to have a value over and above anything that's digitized and anything that's created through uh, artificial intelligence. So I think we need to work. One of the things I think I'm keen to explore with you and other organizations is how we how we reframe the value of handmade. The fact that it is so precious and valuable, it's not a mass produced item, it's a handmade item. That can be a wicker basket, it can be a piece of ceramic, a ceramic bowl, or it could be a stained glass window. That that has a value not only to the maker for their own mental well being, but also for the community at large. You know, it, 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 is, it is valuing that. I think what I rail against a lot of the time is what I call the B and Q mentality the idea that, you know, you say you want to buy a garden or a wrought iron gate to, for your house or whatever. Most people will think of going to B&Q because you can buy a wrought iron gate for 20 quid or whatever, rather than commissioning a blacksmith to make a wrought iron gate. It's completely understandable why people go and be, to B&Q. It's readily available, it's cheap, and it'll do the job. It's because they don't really think of the alternative, which is a handmade gate. They don't see the other values not just the financial values of buying cheap and readily available, but the other values of handmade, bespoke. Yes, it's more expensive, but it's kind of it's 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 we have to kind of develop a way of selling crafts as being as being the go-to rather than the the, the mass produced. You know, and we have to kind of work our way through that in and it it reflects across lots of different disciplines. The handmade has it has a value. It's a very human exchange, you know. And uh, uh, I'd be interested to explore that with you mm -hmm. uh, uh, and with other organizations how we can reframe crafts and re and, and increase the value and the and the perception so that people think about crafts as as the option rather than thinking about buying something off the shelf. I think that's a very profound point. Um... And we're, we're actually coming up to the hour mark. I was going to ask you about your YouTube teaching and your online presence, but I think that was a worthwhile diversion. I think it was uh, really interesting to hear you talk on that topic. And maybe we'll just have to uh, schedule a part two uh, another day. I'd love to. I can't believe the hour is up. <laughs> I know. Um, so I'm just going to uh, say a couple of things just before we wrap up, and I might ask you a, a final question. Um, just to say thank you everyone for attending I'm sure you'll agree with me that it's been absolutely fascinating to hear from Derek uh, this is number 49 I think of our in conversations uh, and you can watch the back catalogue on our website um, uh, thank you everyone for supporting us particularly the, those who made a donation when they signed up for this session uh, we do always say that the best way to support us is by becoming a member, because not only do we get a small financial contribution um, that adds to our, our ongoing sustainability, but we also get you to be part of our community and the ongoing conversation and this movement of people that believe in the, the value and the, the pleasure of uh, the handmade, as we've been talking about today. So if you're not already a member, please do consider signing up and the address for that is on your screen. Uh, so let me just uh, remove the spotlight there and uh, we'll we'll end it on a question looking forward. Uh, what's next for you in your stained glass journey? Are there any upcoming projects or goals that you're excited about sharing? Um, well, I'm involved with sort of designing for new projects on an ongoing basis, um, but I, I'm, I'm doing a lot more teaching and I'm leaning much more into that and providing online courses. So I'm filming my second online course at the moment um, because I find a lot of people, um, I, I do master classes, so people will, will, will come to the studio, but not everybody can come to the studio. So providing an online version of that is really helpful and it's a way of kind of continuing this and supporting the craft. So I'm filming my, my second online course at the moment on stained glass making. My previous one, uh, stained glass painting, 
uh, what it has been has been well received and it continues to be well received. So it's a way of kind of putting the information out there. I made the choice after lockdown to try and pass on the skills as much as I can to the next generation. So I use social media. I use my YouTube channel. There are lots of free tutorials on that. Um, there are online courses if you want a deep dive in that. So I'm really leaning into that, really to try and uh, leave a leave a library of resource material for people to to dip into. And most of it is free, but you know th there are courses available which I will give you ongoing support for as well. So. Uh, that's what I'm working on just now. And I'm very excited to kind of be able to offer that to people because I think it's a way of reaching, a, you know, an international audience. And I think there's an international appetite for learning stained glass. And I think we, you know, we owe it to that next generation to make it as easy as possible for them to discover how to do it. What a wonderful point to end on. And I think some of the technicalities of how you put yourself across online, how you how you set up the the platforms, maybe that's something we can go go into in a in a more technical session in the future. Uh, but I'd just like to say a huge thank you, Derek. It's been absolutely fantastic. I'm sure everyone will agree. Thank you to Biz for fielding the questions in the chat. Thank you for everyone who asked questions and contributed to the discussion. And look forward to seeing you all at the next one. Please keep an eye on our website. Thanks, everyone.